Are you familiar with Google Maps timeline? Anybody? Surely I'm not the only one. Maybe so. It's a feature that I, I suppose comes with having a Gmail uh, email account. It tracks all the places you go uh, and sends you a brief report uh, every month of, so you can see where you've been in that previous month. I, I suppose I should maybe think of that as being a little intrusive. Uh, you know, Google making note of all the places that I go. Um, you know, Big Brother and all uh, watching. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm sure there's a way to turn it off, but that is a skill that I do not possess. Uh, it was actually kind of cool several years ago because uh, when, I, when I had campaigns going in, in different states and, and traveling a lot, uh, you know, I was, it was nice to, to look back and say, okay, yeah, I, I, was, I was pretty busy. It was, it was proof that I was actually doing something, I suppose. And, and in comparison to those days, I'm not going anywhere these days. And that's okay with me. Uh, but back then, the timeline would show sometimes that I would ha have been over 300 places in a month in different states and so forth. And contrast that with this past August, 40 places. <laughs> and even though the number of places were not that great, 40 places that I went to in the month, I couldn't remember, really remember why I went to some of those places. <laughs> you may relate to that. It's interesting to think about to the places that Jesus went during his time on earth. And, and even more interesting to consider and think about why he went where he went. Uh, the where part of Jesus' travel are, are, are pretty well documented in the Gospels, but the why part uh, is not so easily defined. Today's Gospel reading, I think, gives us a, 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 a rare look, a glimpse at, at the why of one particular trip. Now, let me give you a short recap on how we got there. In, in Mark chapter 6, Jesus left Capernaum and went back to his hometown of Nazareth. Uh, in Nazareth, he got rejected for a second time. He continues through Galilee and sends out the 12 apostles to preach the gospel. You remember that? The 12 return uh, to Capernaum from their mission with some good news and some bad. From Capernaum, they go off into a boat uh, with Jesus to a, a quiet place near Bethsaida, which is kind of further up where he feeds 5,000 people. The disciples return across the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus catches up with them by walking on the water. And they land on the plain of Gennesaret, which I guess is on the, on the west side. And Jesus heals a lot of people there. And from Gennesaret, they make their way back to Capernaum, and Jesus teaches for uh, what we uh, stretched into about six weeks. Uh, Jesus teaches on the bread of life uh, there. And then he retreats from Galilee uh, to the region of Tyre and Sidon, which is was farther up north. And it's, it's in Syrian Phoenicia. And that's where the gospel reading picks up today. It's where he heals this lady with the, uh, uh, with the, the or heals the daughter of this, this Gentile. Now, the region of, of Tyre and Sidon, far north of Jerusalem, and a, and a pretty good distance from Capernaum and Galilee, was in many ways a foreign country uh, to those folks. It, it was Gentile country and, and not a formal province of Rome. Interestingly, Jesus goes to the house of someone who's never actually identified in the scripture. And now, now, even though this was Gentile country, there were Jews living there. Uh, and maybe Jesus went to the house of one of the disciples' Jewish friends who lived in the area. But the scripture points out that, that he did not want anyone to know that he was there or where he was, and, and so that his whereabouts could be kept a secret. And so maybe a Gentile family had invited him in. And, and personally, I think that makes sense. After all, it appears Jesus was trying to get away uh, for a little while. And maybe he figured the crowds wouldn't look for him if he was staying in a non-Jewish neighborhood. In any event, the reputation of, of Jesus preceded him, and, and we're introduced to this Syri Syrophoenician woman who was one of those characters in the Bible that has everything going against her. Uh, even so, she pushed her way into Jesus' presence. She was a, a Gentile woman. Uh, she was a Gentile. She was a woman. She was from the wrong side of the tracks to begin with. Uh, she had absolutely no right and no standing whatsoever to engage Jesus in conversation, much less to make a request of him. And, and if 
if you want to contrast, imagine a, 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 you know, the, the poorest person that you've ever met interrupting a state dinner with the President of the United States to ask a favor. It, it just wasn't done. It was, it was unheard of. But in spite of the, of the written and unwritten rules and all the laws and decorum of that time and place, this woman does approach Jesus. She's driven by something far more powerful than uh, protocol and the dictates of society uh, that she normally abides by. She's afraid, desperately afraid for her daughter's life. And so she bows before Jesus and begs him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now, at this point, we kind of expect our kind and, and loving Jesus, meek and mild uh, character to say, of course, I'll, I'll save your daughter. But that is not what happens. Not at all. Uh, have you ever heard, or maybe you've used uh, the phrase, or you've heard someone say, I'm done. I heard a couple of snickers there, and maybe so. Maybe you've said it yourself at some point. The Oxford Language Club says this about that phrase. The phrase, I'm done, is a widely used slang expression that conveys a sense of exhaustion or frustration or both, indicating that a person has reached their limit and can no longer tolerate a situation or task. It, imply, it implies feeling, a, a feeling of being overwhelmed and unable to continue with the current state of affairs. Synonyms are fed up, reached the breaking point, can't take it anymore, maxed out. Over the, the past several days, or, or, or maybe even weeks, Jesus had been rejected and ridiculed, ridiculed by the people who knew him best. He had trained and sent out his disciples to minister and heal in his name, only to find out that while they were out, his cousin and maybe his best friend, John the Baptist, had been executed. He had seen crowds following him. Uh, those crowds grew exponentially, such to the point that he, this miraculous feeding was necessary. Even that didn't satisfy them. They just wanted more. He had taught and healed so many that there wasn't even time for him to eat and to rest. And he, he tried to get away for a little while at one point to pray and then had to walk on water to catch up with the disciples who were at first terrified of him when he did that. And, and he began to realize that if they didn't get it either, their hearts were still hardened and they didn't really understand. They didn't really un even understand why he had fed the multitude and what that meant. When they reached land, the people were everywhere. He couldn't even walk down the street. Uh, people were laying the sick in the roadway for him to heal. There were religious leaders then, too, that come all the way up from Jerusalem who continually hounded him. And when they couldn't win an argument with him, then they would attack his disciples. All that stress and pressure just kept building. And he couldn't get away fast enough. And I can just imagine him turning toward that region of Tyre and Sidon and saying, enough of this. I'm done. I need some rest. And maybe this is one of those great examples of Jesus being both fully God and fully man. We all know what it's like whenever we're exhausted and our guard is down. Uh, sometimes we say things that are true, uh, even if they're hard for others to hear. And is it possible that, that Jesus is caught with his proverbial compassion down in this situation. He says to the woman, let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Jesus is telling this desperate woman that his mission is for the Jews and the Jews alone, and he calls her a dog. Now, there are lots of commentaries and, and uh, so-called scholars who try to soften the language here and suggest that the word for dog is not quite as harsh uh, as it sounds, that Jesus is merely referring to her for referring to her as a pet, as if that makes it better. The best I can tell, and my research and my researching abilities are, are limited, but the best I can tell, the word is dog. And dog is what he means. It's really, it was a pretty common term uh, for Jewish people to call Gentiles in those days. Now, if you had been that woman, what would you have done? Most folks who suffer that kind of embarrassment, suffer words like that, would creep away feeling pretty small and insignificant. But not this woman. At this point, she's thinking she has nothing to lose. And I think she stands up. You know, the scripture says that she came and, and bowed before him. I think at this point she stands up 
And she says, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Wow. Can you imagine that? Hmm. I picture this scene as Jesus standing up then and taking this woman by the shoulders and giving her a big hug and saying, thank you. This is what I've been hoping for. Faith. Genuine faith and boldness in asking for help. Not, not even help for yourself, but for others. For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And that's exactly what she did. And that's exactly what she found whenever she got home. Praise God. And no one knows exactly why Jesus would travel up to the Gentile region of Tyre but the Lord doesn't make any missteps. And, and I believe that Jesus knew that this was where he would find some renewed energy for, the, the, for that fully human aspect of himself. And I like to think that maybe he was just a bit surprised that that dose of renewal came in the form of a Syrophoenician woman who had no standing whatsoever in society. Regardless, he left that place, took the long way back, to the region of Galilee through the Decapolis. That's those 10 cities we call over, that, we, that are over on the, on the, on the east side of, or of the Sea of Galilee. After all, having been renewed, there were, there were more people to heal, more people to teach, more Pharisees and religious leaders to deal with, more time with the disciples, and more to do in preparation for meeting his death on the cross. It was time to get moving. So along the way, they bring a man who is deaf and mute. And what's beautiful about this little sideline in, in Mark's gospel is Jesus' reaction when they bring him the man. The scripture says he took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his finger into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, be opened. He sighed. Jesus looked up into heaven and sighed. Now think about that. We, we pretty much know that, that Peter was dictating this account to Mark uh, about that particular day in the Decapolis. And, and, and there were no doubt countless of healings taking place uh, as they traveled along. And yet Peter remembers and has Mark put down this particular account of the deaf man with the speech problem. Now, in today's world, we know that, that a person with impaired hearing is almost always has trouble speaking plainly. The difference in those days was that that issue then was associated with sin or supposed sin in the person's life. In other words, uh, either there was sin in that person's life or maybe in his parents. That's what caused the deafness. If Google had tracked the travels of Jesus through the Decapolis, there would have been lots of stops, lots of places on the record. And yet Mark records this one particular stop along the way. Why? You, you may think, well, some of you already think I'm about half nuts, but uh, you may think I'm crazy, but I think it was the sigh. I, I think Peter remembered that occasion vividly because of what he saw in Jesus that day. You see, it, it was maybe just a week or, or maybe two weeks later that, that Jesus asked Peter the big question, and Peter's response was, you are the Messiah. And this wasn't a, what, another one, hug kind of sigh. This wasn't a sigh of exasperation. This wasn't a sigh of impatience or irritation. This was a, okay, now I'm ready. This is why I'm here. This is why I came for. This is exactly, I know exactly where I'm going. This was a, a joyful kind of ah, sigh, a sigh of relief. A sigh of delight. The Google Timeline report has some detail on where you go, but none of the why. When I looked back at August, I had to drill down on the map a couple of times uh, to, uh, to a couple of places and try to remember why I went there. That's, I don't know that that's a sign of anything good to not remember that. But the map showed I had gone to Collin County Community College, or Collin County College. I don't guess it's community college anymore one evening, and, and why in the world did I go there? Because it said I stayed there about an hour and a half. 
I had to really think back. Eventually I remembered, oh yeah, there was a seminar that night on something that I guess interested me, although I'm not sure I remember what the seminar was about. <laughs> but there's proof that I was there. We look back uh, on these travels of, of Jesus from Mark's gospel this morning. The stops that would include the, the daughter and the demons and the dogs and the deafness and all that in the Decapolis. If we, if we think and look hard, I think we can see why he went there. Why he went there and did those things. Jesus wanted to teach the disciples and you and I some things, particular things. And I think we can really, if we look a little closer, we can see some of those things, some of those lessons that can be learned from Mark's account. And some of those that come to mind, or came to my mind this week as I read through this, like the Syrophoenician woman, I can be bold when I pray, even demanding. God hears. Location doesn't matter. The little girl was not there with them. My prayers are just as effective when I pray for my friend Douglas in Africa as they are when I pray for my spouse who might be right next to me. Location doesn't matter. God acts. Praying for others is powerful. Maybe more powerful than praying for ourselves because God knows. And meeting our needs, hearing and answering our prayers, these are the things that delight Jesus. And when that happens, God smiles. I'll repeat those lessons that I think are there. Like the Syrophoenician woman, I can be bold. You can be bold when you pray, even demanding. Because God hears, and he can handle it. And the where doesn't matter. Location's not important. Your prayers, my prayers, are just as effective. We're praying for someone far off or the person next to us. And it doesn't really matter where we are when we are praying. Many years ago, a Christian singer-songwriter named Chuck Gerard had a song out that was called Praying on the Freeway. And he lived in Los Angeles, and he said that was his, he spent so much time on the freeway that he had to pray. Pray that he would get to the destination and also just to pray. Location doesn't matter. Praying for others is powerful, maybe even more powerful than praying for ourselves. And that last lesson, maybe the one that's the most exciting, meeting our needs, hearing and answering our prayers, those are the things that delight Jesus. This is good news. Thanks be to God.